Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to t this afternoon's session on selection tasks for games, animation, communication design and industrial design here at RMIT. Thank you so much for joining us as part of this next fest series. I uh, have an absolutely jam-packed session um, involving quite a few selection officers and lecturers here from RMIT. But first and foremost, I'd like to introduce myself. So I, my name is Daniel and I work uh, as part of the marketing and student recruitment team here at RMIT University. Um, and I'll be the MC for the session. So like I said, quite a few um, speakers as part of it. And they'll all provide tips and tricks um, as well as advice for preparing your selection tasks, folios, um, as well as interviews as part of our selection process into our design programs. I'd like to start off the session by acknowledging the people of the Woiwurrung and Boonwurrung language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nation, on whose unceded lands we conduct the business of the university. RMIT respectfully acknowledges the, the ancestors and elders past and present, um, acknowledges the traditional custodians and ancestors of the lands and waters across Australia where we conduct our business. We're really committed at RMIT to um, reconciliation and redefining relationship in working with, uh, re in redefining our relationship in working with um, and supporting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders um, and in self-determination. So our university's goal is to achieve lasting transformation by maturing its values, culture, policy and structures in a way that embeds reconciliation in everything we do in line with the principles of Bunjil. Over on the uh, next slide, um, I just want to walk you through some of the proceedings. So just um, as the initial, um, I will um, provide you a bit of an overview um, as to some of the application process, um, as well as the VTAC guidelines when you're applying for uh, your selection tasks. Um, and then we'll start the session with game design selection tasks. So we'll have Christian McRae on board to provide information on those selection tasks. And then we'll go animation with Dr. Gina Moore, industrial design with Dr. Judith Glover, um, and then communication design with David Cutter. So just noting also that our live chat is open. So if you have questions throughout the proceedings, we've got a whole team on board. So everyone from our admissions teams to the um, our representatives from the School of Design on board to help you tonight. And so ask those questions throughout. Um, and also just noting that the session will be recorded um, and available to view on demand throughout August, the remainder of August and September. So if you sort of get stuck throughout your selection task and need to go back and watch the video, that's okay. Um, it will be available to view on the open day platform where you've come through today. Also just want to make mention that there will be more sessions with the School of Design um, throughout Open Day. So we've got on Sunday the 29th, so this coming Sunday, um, there are design sessions as well. So um, if you're wanting more information on the programs, that's a really good opportunity for you to connect with program managers and hear more in depth about the programs. Whereas tonight we'll be touching on the selection task and the actual application um, section or component of each of the programs. Moving on to the next slide, so just some of the important dates, which you may or may not know. So um, in terms of the VTAC timely application period, that's now open, it opened on the 2nd of August. So year 12s now have the opportunity to go in there and put in their preferences. And these must close on the 30th of September at 5 p.m. So really, really important that um, you lock in those preferences by that date. Um, season scholarship applications close on the 8th of October, so really important to note this down as well. Um, if you're applying for special consideration or a scholarship or you're a part of one of our SNAP schools, really important to note down that date too because you need to submit that application by that date. There won't be any extensions through VTAC. There's the ATAR release date as well, so that's on the 16th of December, and then there's a change of preference period. So um, should you want to have a play around with your preferences, that change of preference period is your time to sort of go in there, make sure that your preferences are in order. You've got pathways in there as well, um, because the first round of offers will be on the 14th of January. So if you're in year 12 this year, that's when you'll receive that offer into the first program as part of your eight preferences that you're eligible for entry into. 
On the next slide, um, I just wanted to sort of provide a bit of an overview as to the undergraduate course offerings in that within our School of Design. So we've got our Bachelor of Design Animation and Interactive Media, the Bachelor of Design Communication Design, Bachelor of Design Games, and then the Bachelor of Industrial Design Honours. And we've listed out the, um, the VTAC codes there as well. Um, and just noting that the, there's double degrees with engineering through industrial design, um, and they will have separate VTAC codes. The Bachelor of Design with Digital Media, there's no presentation on that pro specific program this evening um, because they don't actually have a selection task for entry. They look at um, ATAR as well as prerequisites. So if you're interested in that program, um, have a look at that course on our program page, but also come along to Open Day on Sunday because there's a digital design session on offer um, and we'll sort of provide more information um, about that sort of later in the program. But um, I just wanted to flag that that program is also on offer within the School of Design. Um, a really good opportunity also tonight to just touch on pathways really quickly. So um, should you um, be looking for pathways into our design programs, RMIT has a really good tool um, and the link's there, pathways.rmit.edu.au, um, which provide um, streamlined sort of admissions processes for students looking to get into our design program. So those listed on the screen actually provide sort of clear cut pathways to our students into design programs. And when you go into that uh, that onto that pathways webpage, you can type in the course that you want to go into and it will list the best pathway for you as well as um, the amount of years total it will take for you to complete. So um, if you haven't already and you're starting to put in your VTAC applications um, and your preferences and you're not sure on the best pathway, our tool is uh, sort of uh, the, the best place to start because it gives you a really clear cut approach as to um, the best option for you moving forward into that dream program. Um, I also just wanted to um, flag uh, over on the next slide some of the selection task closing dates. So this is for the programs listed uh, and presenting as part of the session tonight. Um, and that, so animation and interactive media, communication design, games, and then industrial design. I do want to flag that other programs that are MIT, so say, for example, architecture, do have different closing dates. So please um, if you're interested in a range of programs at RMIT, please also look at um, the selection task closing dates because that's really, really important. Um, but for the programs listed to, uh, presenting tonight, the um, closing date for that January offer round and to be considered is the 19th of November. Um, and you'll see there that um, late submissions are not accepted for animation and interactive media and communication design. Um, but And then for games and industrial design, they may continue to accept um, selection tasks past that date, but just noting that um, that is until, um, I guess, places fill in within the program. So best bet is to always um, submit before that 19th of November deadline. Um, and if you need any advice on your selection task, whether that's uploading or anything along those lines, um, the friendly team at the design at rmit.edu.au, um, the School of Design email that listed there, um, will be able to provide that type of advice with submission or if you're having any questions on how to submit, where to submit, whatever it might be, um, the team are on board to assist. Um, but um, without further ado, I'd like to pass it over to Christian McRae, who um, works within our game design area, to present on selection tasks within um, game design. Over to you, Christian. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Daniel, and uh, welcome again to everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, online, uh, whether it's the afternoon, the evening, uh, or the morning, if you're joining us from somewhere else. Um, it's my privilege to talk to you about the degree that I teach into, which is the Bachelor of Games uh, degree. So um, I want to just uh, emphasize that this uh, degree that is a creative culture degree and one in which students will work both uh, as individuals and as uh, and in, in teams. And we do that in a very unique way online, being games, and I'll talk about that at a couple of points. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the main thing to discuss um, before we do anything else is that, of course, is that games are made in a studio environment. Now, studios are a little bit different online, but we use the tools that are relevant to games, 
such as Discord um, and uh, in-game tools to replicate and mutate the studio experience. So where possible, we are, despite COVID, largely uninterrupted in our process because, of course, we're games, so we, we, were, we have that advantage. But um, the, other, the other thing that makes that possible is that we are a multidisciplinary area. Games need multiple types of students. We need uh, multiple types of expertise to make games, so we need to train multiple types of students to make great video games, and that's part of our journey um, together. Next slide, please. Um, our successful student projects in the last few years have really benefited from our uh, focus um, on art, the strengths of the degree and one of the strengths of the university. We are an art and design university with a legacy in art and design production that is second to none in Australia. Um, and we really use that and lean into that to focus on game art style as part of the um, background for students. So some of the projects that have gone on to be very successful, um, both uh, commercially uh, or creatively and uh, in the public eye, include um, game series like Frog Detective, which starts um, in one of our studios, and Paper Bark. Um, and we've had lots and lots of student successes um, as independent game creators and uh, as uh, as go going on to work um, in international, um, interstate and local industry as well. So now that we've gone the basics, let's talk about selection. Uh, next slide, please. Um, like uh, any other, there are some basic requirements uh, to join us at RMIT, um, a study st score of at least, uh, at least 30 um, or equivalent. Um, the main thing is that we have a folio entry, and this is a very general and relaxed folio entry, and I'll explain this in some detail. Um, there is a brief statement as well, again, which I'll talk about. Once we receive these folios, um, some applicants will be interviewed and some applicants will be offered a place straight away. That's not to say that the best get in straight away. In fact, we love interviewing students because we love to meet students, ask what they want to make, um, and uh, we take the opportunity to interview and talk to as many students as possible because that's one of the best parts of the process, finding out what games you like, what you want to make, um, and that really, really helps us to understand what mix of students we'll be able to pull together. Uh, next slide, please. So um, the folios that we really look for are three or four pages in a PDF, and we try to get a wide range of students to apply. Many students will concentrate on visual art and illustration, put a few of their drawings or artwork together on a three-page PDF. Some students will give us some fiction or nonfiction writing, some personal creative projects. Um, they might do their um, they might do their viscom uh, folio and represent that for a few pages. And of course, if they're already comfortable, they'll be making game design diagrams or designs in a appropriate software suite or on paper. And if they've um, made any mods or games uh, or levels or anything like that, then then of course they're free to send us a link to something uh, which we can have a quick look at as well. Uh, next slide, please. So the two aspects uh, that a student needs to uh, pull together are a very quick personal statement, and this will describe your reasons for applying. And of course, we expect lots of, I've been playing games since I was a kid, of course, um, but what this can really, really do is explain what the work you have submitted can do for you and why, why you're you know why you're proud of it and what journey you're on rather than sort of uh, you know groveling saying please let me in it's much more interesting for us for you to be confident in yourself and say what sort of artist or designer you would like to be so we're very keen to read those statements and we do take them very seriously um say perhaps if you your work you might have uh, say studied in a school which didn't have art support but you still submitted art and if you say so in your statement, we take that very seriously and we will give you an interview to meet you and understand why you're so committed uh, despite that. So that's the sort of thing. So it's very supportive and, and very reflective of our attitude. Now for the folio itself, like I said, any creative work from your previous studies or personal projects, any style or topic, sculpture, film, photography, 
animation, drawing, whatever it is, because games is not normal. Games requires that multidiscipline, multidiscipline approach. We need all of your disciplines to bring them together. However, the one thing we do need you to bring together is the PDF format so that we can look at your folios very, very quickly and link us uh, as best as possible to any online work you want to. Um, and of course, uh, if you have any work on your on that PDF, just a brief description or title so we can understand um, what you're submitting. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, what we're looking for <clears throat> is a creative focus, basically evidence that you've begun your creative journey in life. Uh, that's as simple as I can put it. Um, a broad frame of reference and the evidence that a student is drawing on ideas outside of games is fantastic um, and not just a narrow range of commercial games. So I can tell you straight away, if you submit like a few sketches of a cyber ninja with a mask on with a blood soaked blade on a rain slicked mountaintop, I will say, thank you very much. I love you. That's wonderful work. Please try again next year. We have enough cyber ninjas, um, as you can imagine. And of course, uh, it, we really, really want to meet students that are community and socially minded because the world of games is changing very, very quickly. Um, and so any evidence that a student is aware and sensitive of social, cultural and community dynamics in games. So not just engaging with the text of a game uh, and playing it, um, but is aware of the discussions and um, elements that go around um, the social cultural dynamics of games. We're a very um, diverse and inclusive community um, at RMIT Games. Uh, more than half of our students uh, identify as women or non-binary. So we have very different culture than the internet. So we need to make sure that we have a, a sort of welcoming uh, an open community uh, each year that we start. Um, and I think that's my last slide is next. So thank you very much. I will go and read the chat and uh, find out if there's any questions. And if you have any, that would be great. I might um, throw a couple at you, Christian, if that's okay. Do you have any indication as to the, the size of the co uh, you know, the the amount of um, students we let in for game design? I know it's quite competitive. It is. It's very, very competitive. Um, we look to produce uh, a cohort of about four classrooms. So we're looking at about sort of 80 to 90 each year. Um, and we're looking to produce, um, depending on the balance of those students, we might take a lot of artists, some writers, some designers, a couple of programmers, um, and, and see what the mix is. But I would say about 80 or 90. Great. Thank you. And just one question on equipment used as part of the program. So is there specific software that students should have uh, or, you know, hardware, whatever it might be? A great question and one that we get every, every year and it gets easier and easier to answer now that we're online. Um, the best thing you can do is make the switch before we do towards free, cheap software. So moving off Adobe um, workflows into free alternatives such as Blender and um, and cheaper alternatives for game engines as well. So when you study with us, we give you access to a bunch of um game technologies uh, and licenses and, and software licenses that you're going to need. But we nothing pushes the envelope in terms of 3D graphics, so you don't need special hardware. If you're an artist, you probably have a digital drawing tablet. Um, but if you don't, that would be an investment. And the other investment is to put aside a – make a budget with you or your parents for you to buy, play, and understand – a wider range of video games. And that is a serious, that's not a joke. It's like have a game budget, play small independent games uh, and pay for them if you don't already. That is the best tool um, that you can get. Everything else in games, the technology level is coming down and down and down all the time. So 3D cards, let the, let the Bitcoin people have the, you don't need them. Wonderful. Thank you so much, um, Christian. I know you've just moved house and you're uh, hot spotting off your phone at the minute, so I really <laughs> appreciate your time this afternoon. The show um, must go on. The show must yeah, go on. That's right. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I might pass over to our next speaker. So we have Dr. Gina Moore, who um, is representing animation this afternoon, um, and will walk us through the selection tasks as part of that program. So over to you, Gina. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks, Daniel. Um, do you want to go to the next slide, Tim? I'm basically going to um, read through what is uh, 
what is required and I'll add any extra information and obviously please feel free to ask questions. So um, in the animation program, we we don't look at ATAR scores or anything like that. We we really focus entirely on what we call the selection task. And there's basically three parts to it. They are the storyboard, which is also called the visual storytelling task, uh, folio images, which are also called printed images, which I personally find a very strange thing because they're probably going to be submitted uh, digitally. But anyway, there you go. And also the applicant statement. You can include links to other work, including if you've done any animations or anything, you could include them as links in your folio images, but you should know that they will be the last thing we look at and a lot of the uh, select the selection um, people won't actually look at them. So don't assume that the links will be looked at. It's really the first three items on the bottom of this slide that you can be guaranteed we will look at very carefully. We'll read your statement um, and we'll look at the folio images and the storyboard. I've listed them here in the, the order of importance and this is because I've noticed people take a lot of, um, they put a lot of well, what would you say, importance on the storyboard. And they also put a lot of importance on the folio image, a little bit less on the application statement. So I've just listed them what I think is kind of the most important stuff, but those three will all be taken into account. Next slide, Tim. So the applicant statement, this is straight off the website. Describe your reasons to, for wanting to study, what interests you about um, animation. The interactive media bit is a red herring. Forget about that. It's really animation, and I think we will eventually change our name. So you don't have to worry so much about the interactivity. Um, we're more focused on straight animation than interactivity. Having said that, we do do stuff with VR and various stuff. There is interactivity in it, but don't get stuck on that wording. It's a bit of a hangover from, uh, yeah, the old days. Include the influences of your work. So tell us what excites you. Why do you want to do animation? Um, what animations do you like? And what would you what could you see yourself making? Next slide, Tim. Okay, the printed images, which I also call the folio images. Uh, you're going to provide 12 images, and you're going to choose the best 12 that you feel showcase your creativity. Images must not exceed A4 size and must be in a single PDF. Again, the, the reference to size there I personally find baffling, but if you open Photoshop and look at the DPI, I guess you can work that out. The important part of that sentence is it's 12 images, but we want one PDF. So if you give us 12 PDFs, we're automatically going to think, hmm, this person doesn't quite know how to read instructions or doesn't quite know how to create a single PDF out of 12 images. Your work might be mind-blowing and you might still get in, but you're already behind the eight ball. So that is really important. 12 different images, 12 different pieces of work, one PDF. Um, I know it's I'm being pedantic, but I just see a lot of people kind of slip up on that. It's hard to know what's important and what's not so important. Um, so the tips, your work can be created in any medium. So it might even be sculpture. You might take some photos of, of a three-dimensional object that you've created and um, you can include those in the PDF. If you were to do so, you're welcome to actually you know, let's say you've created a single sculpture, you want to show it off, you've taken a number of different photographs of it, you, you, you could arrange them on one page because it's a single artwork. So a single page of the PDF could have more than one image if it's of a, a single artwork, if that makes sense. Um, show, the best, show, show your best work, the work that you are most proud of. That sounds obvious, 
But we find sometimes people show their work from school, even though they didn't particularly like the projects they were given at school, that they think, oh, well, my art teacher must be right, so I'll put this in. I got an A. I don't think it's very good. We want to see what you think is good. So put the stuff that you are most proud of, not the stuff your mum's most proud of or your art teacher is most proud of. Show us what 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 you like because that will give us an indication of um, – what motivates you and, and, and where you want to go potentially. You don't have to show a wide variety. It says breadth is not necessary. You don't need to show a wide variety of styles or medium. So don't feel like, oh, I've already shown one of my sculptures. I better show, you know, a drawing or something. If you've got 12 amazing sculptures, I keep going on about sculptures tonight, but let's just say pencil drawings. You've got 12 amazing pencil drawings. You, you, you're welcome to focus on that. You don't have to show us that you've already you, you've also done oil painting or something, unless your oil painting is also as beautiful as your pencil drawings. But yeah, we don't we don't think you have to have done lots of different media. We're just happy to see what what you think is best. Uh, this one's important as well. Also show sketches and perhaps work in progress. It doesn't have to be finished, highly polished work. I think this is important because a lot of people have spent, you know, a lot of time on particular works, as I say, that they've done in school. But you might have done stuff at home which is a bit unfinished, but it might show more promise. So feel free to put it in, even if it is unfinished. Perhaps just make a, a comment and tell us that it's unfinished. Show works you have produced for school if you're proud of them, but also consider showing other work even if it's unfinished. Well, that's just saying what I've already said. So, cool. What's next, Tim? Okay, so we've got some examples. This slide shows two different uh, pages from two different submissions. Obviously, they're a single page out of a um, out of people's uh, out of the submissions of two applicants. And I, I chose these two examples just because they're quite different. So you'll see the applicant on the left has taken a photograph of a um, what looks to be either an oil painting or a gouache or an um, acrylic painting of some kind. I like the way the applicant has also put the name of the painting and they've put the media, so the way that they created it, and it, there's some kind of description there which I can't read at this level. But this is not to say you have to arrange your PDF like this. I'm just giving you some examples of successful applicants. So that's um, that's a good kind of format. And then the one on the right, it looks like a digital uh, character study, and um, yeah. As, as they have said, they're original characters. I think it's good to have, it doesn't have to be a long statement, but it's good to have some kind of description of, of the images so that we can see what medium it is. And this person has stated original characters, which I also think is quite helpful because not being across, you know, all, all the, um, everything that's going on, sometimes we don't know if it's fan art and maybe we, sometimes we might assume it is, but there it's not or vice versa so I think it's good to be um, obvious about it uh, what's next Tim okay this is the visual storytelling task which is um, oh, I'll just read it from the top create a visual storyboard with a sequence of pictures without words or text based on one of the themes uh, and then it lists four themes Tell the story as a comic book strip, comic strip style sequence using no more than 12 postcard size images. You may use hand-drawn, graphic, collage, or photographic means to tell to create the images. The storyboard must be formatted as a single PDF. Um, so that's straight off the website. So you'll be able to read that on the website. And now I'll give you some tips about it on the next slide. Thanks, Tim. So the assessors deliberately choose themes that are open-ended. That's pretty obvious, but some people think, oh, what, it, what type of bat are they talking about? Well, 
the point is, it's any type of bat you want. It can be a cricket bat or, you know, an animal or whatever. So they're, de- they're always going to give you words that are just, you know, you can interpret in your own way. So don't try to work out what's the right answer. There isn't one. Assessors are interested in your ideas. That is the story you want to tell. So if you can think of an interesting story which features that um, prompt word, then that is obviously a great thing. Assessors are interested in your ability ability to, to tell a story using pictures. You can use any medium for this. I already said that, photography. But it's, it's interesting what it says next. It says, we prefer to see hand-drawn work, which shows some drawing ability. This will come up again a bit later. If we get a folio which has got no hand drawing in it, people do get a bit worried. The assessor, the, the assessment panel will arm and ah quite a lot. And sometimes the work is just outstanding and you will get in. But if you can draw, do include some hand-drawn stuff. So if your storyboard or your visual storytelling task is done with photographs, I suggest you definitely include some drawing in your folio um, and vice versa. I personally think the photographed um, visual storytelling tasks tend not to do quite so well. It would have to be really good to get the assessor's attention, I think, rather than something that's actually uh, created by you. Um, Assessors are looking for something visually appealing that also communicates a story. It might be cute, funny, serious, simple, complex or scary. We will appreciate it if it's interesting, intriguing and appealing. Pretty repetitive, but basically you get that We want a cool story, but we also want it to be clearly communicated. So if we look at it and we go, wow, this looks great, like it's such a great drawing skill um, and, you know, beautiful camera angles, but I have no idea what's going on. I personally kind of like stuff like that, but most of the assessment panel will go, no, they can't communicate a story and Yeah, so it's got to be really clearly communicated if you want to win everyone over. So it's got to be beautifully done, lovely to look at, but also communicated story. It's got to do a lot of things. Next slide, Tim. Plan ahead. This is really for the whole selection uh, kit, but particularly for the storytelling task. I would try a number of different um, ideas. And don't don't think, oh, yeah, I've got an idea, so I know what I'm going to do. I'll just do it, you know, on the last day. Have an idea, rough it out, and then show it to people and see if it works and see if you can improve on it. Starting early and iterating and getting advice from lots of different people is going to give you a much better outcome. Because don't forget, the, the assessment panel, the people who will assess your folio, they're quite diverse. So, so one person might get the joke straight away, but you 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 really need to target a range of people. So if you can show your work to lots of different people and see if they all get it, not just your best friend because they, they probably think like you do, but also show it to your mum or your grandma or your next door neighbour. Um, I just think, if you, yeah, you've got a really good chance of, of winning over the whole panel. And don't use text. Because if you do, even just like the label on something, I mean, it's not a, entirely against the rules, but people, the, the, the assessors really want to see if you can tell a story just using pictures. So if you can avoid words, then that's going to be a really good thing. And before you finalise it, test your ideas on someone else. I've, I've already said that, so that's good. Um, If they don't understand what's going on, don't think, oh, well, they're stupid. Think, oh, how could I make it clearer? So take on that advice. Okay, Tim, what's next? Oh, yeah, here's some examples. Great. So, again, I've really just chosen these for the diversity. Looks like the left one is created directly on the computer, I'm thinking. And it's grayscale, black and white. 
which is pretty cool. And the right one is created with um, watercolour on paper and scanned. And we've got another example on the next slide, Tim, or two more examples. I hope it's clear that these are actually, yeah, different applicants. I'm sure it is clear. So the left one is, is um, you know, quite rough, but really nice drawings. And the right one is a lot more slick and it looks like it's created directly on the computer. They're all great examples. And I, I suspect these are all successful applicants. I'm pretty sure, I hope so. Um, yeah, so hopefully those four examples will just give you a sense of the diversity of styles and everything that we get. And hopefully it also answers some of the questions that I've just had a quick, a quick squeeze at. So they can be very different. They can be quite sketchy. Appealing. I think the word appealing, I mean, it's very ambiguous and difficult, but I think rough drawings can be really appealing, as can highly finished, fully coloured artworks. They can all be appealing. What makes something appealing is, is difficult to say, but I guess we're hoping you will have an, an idea of, of how, to, how to wow us. Okay, what's, what's next? All right, so we've got some sort of do's and don'ts now, and this is just to wrap it up. And I'm going to be obviously repeating myself a little bit, but just to drive the points home, we want two PDFs, one for the storyboard and one for the folio images. We like to see evidence of drawing ability because we find that some students struggle with the course if, if they can't draw. Um, this, however, is not a deal breaker. There are talented and successful applicants who don't include sketches and who express themselves in other ways. So if you're sitting there thinking, oh no, this is the end, I can't draw, I hate drawing, but I know I would make a great animator, apply. Because people do get on, it, they, they do get in without any drawing ability whatsoever and they do really well. It's just that they're fewer. So I'm just being honest with you. If you tick the drawing box, um, you just got a better chance of getting in because everyone will go, oh yeah, totally, I've got no problems. But if you don't, if you don't include any drawing, you just have to be really, really good and, and impress us in, a, in some other way. And the next, which I think is the final one, this is what we don't want. So this is what to definitely not do. We don't want you to submit an online folio. So the amount of times we get like a link to a Beyonce site or something like that, it's a bit heartbreaking because sometimes I click on it and I'm like, wow, this works really great. But other people won't even click on it because they're like, that is not the assessment task. So don't – look – you can sneak the link into the PDF somewhere and you can think, well, someone like Gina might click on it. Totally, that's fine. But don't expect the assessors to click on it because most of them won't. And it's partly because we've got a lot of um, things to assess, but it's more because they want the system to be equitable. So we want to assess everyone on the same type of work. And not everyone has access, you know, not, not everyone has the ability to build a website for their application. So that's why we don't, we don't say we want that kind of site. The other reason that it's hard to assess an online folio is because, you know, we might not click on all the right links. We might not see things in the right order, all that kind of stuff. So that's why we go lo-fi, we say we want two PDFs and that's what we can guarantee we will base our assessment on. Uh, we don't want to see poorly presented work. So, for example, low resolution PDFs. This is a big one. When you have created your PDF from whatever program you created in, check it. If it looks all pixelated or blurry or, you know, just bad, do it again. And if you can't work out how, find someone who can help you. Because the way you present your work is really, really important. And we do get some pretty dodgy looking PDFs and it's it's a great shame because we just can't see the work properly. Um, 
And also equally, if you're taking photos of your work or doing scans of your work, make sure they're really high quality. Like it, the one I showed you before, the storyboard, which is a watercolour, it, it's touch and go, isn't it? Because you would have seen the shadows from f between the black and the coloured part. So I think they could have done a better job with the scanning process um, just to make the work look better, which is inherently a beautiful work, but it could have it could have been presented slightly better. So really spend a bit of time on the presentation. The other thing we don't want to see is folios, which only contain highly derivative work like fan art. I personally find that stuff really boring and um, other people probably find it more interesting than I do, but we won't admit anyone who only does that kind of work because we're we are more interested in your original ideas. And the, I think the next slide is just links, but let's check. check. Tim, can you go to the next slide? Yeah. All right, Gina, I might um, just throw a question at you if that is okay. Um, quite a few questions coming in through the chat and Gina will be able to assist. Um, but just qu a quick question, can you draw the storyboard digitally and does it need to be fully coloured? and fully designed characters and perfectly refined from your perspective? Yeah, short answer is no, it doesn't have to be fully coloured. And um, in terms of fully designed characters, I guess the short answer is no. However, if we need to be able to see that the character is the same from one frame to the next. So there needs to be some consistency Actually, I'm making an assumption there that it's in a, that it's a character-based story. If it's a character-based story and it's important for the viewer to know this is character one in this frame and it's the same character appearing in the next frame, obviously there has to be some kind of character design. So um, I guess it's a case-by-case -case basis. But in terms of um, does it have to be fully coloured, Short answer is no, and ho hopefully you saw the black and white examples, which were really great. And they also don't have to be kind of slick. They can certainly be quite rough, especially if they're rough in a way that shows an aptitude for drawing. I actually think that's really great, which is quite hard to do, by the way. Well, thank you so much, Gina. Um, that was absolutely brilliant. Even I learned quite a bit. Um, so I am um, going to just um, ask you to please jump on the chat. There's quite a few questions coming through for animation. Gina will be able to assist, so keep those questions coming. We're just uh, running a little short of time, so thank you so much, Gina. But I might throw over to Dr Judith Glover to um, speak to the Bachelor of Industrial Design Honours Selection Task. Over to you, Judith. Thank you so much. Judith, you are on mute, so um, just sorry. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. Um, I'll keep it as quick as possible because I think a lot of the stuff the others have said about creativity or, um, you know, making sure that your files are clear and all of this sort of stuff, um, I think are really applicable to, to all the folios. Um, so I represent the Industrial Design Program. We're a four-year honours degree. Um, that slide there, um, it shows a smattering, an absolute tiny smattering of the work, but the stuff on the right pertaining to the bike project is what would be a fairly traditional type of industrial design project where somebody's prototyping uh, a product. Um, these days, the things that then start to come into that are more electronic prototyping. You know, uh, going back 20 years ago, you wouldn't have done that. Um, now our students do our own uh, electronic prototyping. And then the stuff on the, the very far left starts to have coding and interaction in it. So as people move around that object, it, it, uh, it kind of it moves with them. Um, and it's quite a complex project. Um, and so some of the uh, – so traditionally, you know, industrial design would have been – uh, automotive, furniture, lighting, uh, product design, and now it's quite an expansive field. Um, and we do things which are even quite dematerialised, which is service design, um, which is about designing services. And our students are really, really good at those projects because they have a lot of knowledge around how people um, and objects and technology interact. So it's not just about drawing flowcharts of this moves here and all of that sort of stuff. 
it's actually a really good tacit and innate knowledge of all of that stuff uh, learned through uh, making and prototyping skills. Uh, next slide, Tim. Thank you. Um, the ATAR it looks reasonably low at uh, 54, but that's just a sort of a benchmark um, which lines it up with the pathways courses coming in. Probably uh, three quarters of our course, people are sitting at 70 and above, and then, you know, a good third of our course, people are in that 80 or 90 bracket. Um, we have about 35% uh, mixture of uh, girls, 35-40% girls, um, and the rest, and the rest, uh, uh, I was going to say male students, but of course <laughs> there is that uh, in between. So, um, uh, but just to say that it traditionally was probably a male-dominated project, but we're, we're, we've been sitting at that sort of non-male kind of 35, 40% um, for quite a while now, for decades now, um, and producing a lot of um, other graduates than males. Um, getting myself tied up in knots here. Um, we do have some excellent uh, pathways courses uh, to come into industrial design, and that is the um, associate degree of furniture and also the uh, diploma of product design. The thing to look out for there in those prerequisites is the English, and this applies to all the other programs too. Um, RMIT has a kind of a, a sort of a line in the sand for English um, in that uh, around that 30 mark. Um, and if you don't get it, then you're not going to get into any of the degree courses. So if you're sitting there in New Zealand, be very aware that you actually need to do English um, or anywhere else you're coming from anywhere else. Um, uh, but having said that, if you don't make that, then you can go into some of these fantastic pathways courses and segue across and you'll get credit for that. Um, thank you, Tim. Next slide. Okay, so the applicant statement, very similar to the others. We want you to just be authentic. So tell us about yourself. Um, we generally have two types of students, which you'll see in our folios and selection stuff, which is your high school student or somebody around that age. Um, and then you've got a mature age student that's gone off and done a bunch of stuff, maybe or maybe not related to design. So we're asking you to tell us your motivations. Why do you want to come and do ID? What do you like about ID? Um, you know, things like around sustainability, that sort of stuff. We have a lot of sustainability embedded in our course. Um, our first year studios, for instance, you do user-centered design and you do sustainable design. Um, and that flows all the way through the course. And what we're trying to say to students is people and planet matter. Um, so we don't just necessarily want to know, you know, it's great if you can say, look, these are my favourite designers or whatever, or I really like, I'm really interested in sustainable design, or I'm really interested in new biomaterials, that sort of stuff. But I'm quite happy for you to tell us about things that you do outside of work or school, particularly creative stuff. You know, if you do photography um, or cooking or music, or you like DJing or going to festivals or baking puppetry, whatever, um, tell us. If you do volunteering, um, tell us, look, I'm quite happy. I've been the selection officer for years and I'm quite happy if people say, I work at the supermarket. You know, I work at Woolies. Like to me, if you're a 15-year-old, 16-year-old and you're working at Woolies, that just shows you've got a bit of drive. So um, just tell us about yourself and be authentic. Um, spelling and grammar also matter. So um, do get it checked, put it into, go and put it back into Word and put it through spell check and grammar check and make sure um, that it's correct um, before you submit it. Thanks, Tim. Next slide. So as I said, two options um, on the selection tasks. Um, one is if you're coming from high school, so they're more like design projects, discrete design pro projects, or the other is work life um, experience. Um, I'll talk about the tips when we go to the different options. Tim, do you want to flip to the next slide? Um, so the design projects, and this is more for uh, people who are coming from high school um, who have been sitting there doing design and tech or viscom, those sort of subjects, and you're doing uh, complete projects, or say you're coming from another um, design discipline. You might be segueing over from architecture or you might have gone and done something like uh, set design at VCA and then you, you actually got halfway through and you're like, don't want to do that anymore, I want to go and do industrial design. Um, then you've actually got whole projects that you can show. You can show them from um, inception 
what was the brief or what was the concept or what was the inspiration um, through to here's my here's my conceptual work, here's my design development, here's me trying to model make or make stuff, and then uh, and then here's the outcome. Um, next slide, Tim. So then work or life experience. So this is for mature age students. Um, and we get quite a few and we really like them because as some of the other programs were saying before, we like the mix. We don't just want everybody to be out of high school. Um, not that there's anything wrong with high school students, but it's good to have a diversity. It's good to have a diversity of types of people and it's good to have a diversity of life experience. And the mature age students bring a lot. In industrial design, you're, you are mostly solving problems for other areas. So you're solving sustainability problems or health problems, for instance, or transportation problems. So to have life experience um, or to innately know something, and a lot of our students create projects because either something's happened to them or somebody they know, um, and then they go, that's a thing that's needed, and then they'll go forth and they'll, they'll innovate. Um, so life experience is really, really important. But then what do you do? So because you may not have a classic design folio. Um, so we're quite happy for you to tell us about your life, your motivations, um, what you want to do. And it might not be that you're pu putting in that classic um, design folio. Uh, next slide, Tim. Um, what are we assessing? I'm just trying to read the slide up here and it's cutting off, it's cutting off bits of it. Um, so again, there'll be some key things like uh, like some of the stuff that Gina and the others mentioned. If you're really good at drawing, show it. The one thing that we kind of need to see in industrial design is some sort of making capability. So for instance, we'll get a folio from high school. Somebody's done Viscom um, and they've done a lot of, uh, they might be able to show drawing and illustrator and oh, I can do a brand or I can do, um, um, I can do a typography or whatever. But then they, they don't show how any of that can be applied to the 3D. Even if it's taken and put on some sort of packaging design over here, I've done a tea brand, and then they actually make up the packaging. We really, really crave to see something three-dimensional. Um, it's really hard for us to judge um, if you're not showing something three-dimensional. And so there's other ways of doing that. You can do things in Google SketchUp. Um, there's plenty of free programs out there. Um, and again, if you've actually done some things in CAD, um, in design and tech, that sort of stuff, um, please put that in. Um, if you know any Adobe Suite, um, you're going to be using plenty of that sort of stuff, uh, put that in. Next slide, thanks Tim. Um, important dates, um, I think it's probably, we're going to probably be slightly running out of time, so um, I think these are the same dates, is Daniel, is that correct? These are all the same dates correct, for everybody yeah. else? Correct, um, yes. so there's probably no point me uh, particularly running through that. So it might be better if I do, um, we move it along and I, if you need me to do any um, Q&A. I think that's Thanks. the last slide, isn't it, Tim? Uh, there's an FAQ as well. So what should students start? What subjects should what, students what should, study? Uh, if you're in high school, well, look, you'd be doing things in arts and technology. But even something, if you're doing food tech, food can be incredibly creative. Um, and we've had people put folios in. Even if you, like, if you just really like MasterChef, um, go ahead. Like, that would be a really left of field kind of thing to show us. Um, so generally, you're doing something like VizCom or Design and Tech. Um, uh, but, look, having said that, um, I led in a student uh, mid-semester who was coming from the United States. She had done a lot of science um, and she actually, uh, she'd done science and kind of engineering type subjects. And then she actually did these folio pieces where she'd actually come up with, she'd been working in a glass museum and she'd come up with these really weird kind of glass machines. Um, and it was very, she'd done the physics calculations and all of that. And I went, okay, you're creative, you're smart, you're in. Um, so yeah, don't think that you just have to do that classic ID, I need to put in a car in my folio or something like that. I would say do the things that you're really passionate about. Do you need previous experience in the design I field? No, particularly if you're a mature age student, no. If you're coming in as a mature age student and you don't have that experience but you really want to, and like going back maybe four or five years ago, we let a guy in who'd been in the RAF for 10 or 12 years. 
So he'd been in the Air Force. He was an engineer. I know there's a link between engineering and industrial design that makes sense. Um, but we're, but that's also a really open-minded choice from us to go, yep, you've got amazing life experience. You're going to be really interesting in the program. And he was. He was fantastic. Um, but again, so just tell us, like, what are your motivations? The thing about industrial design is it's a it's it's an area you don't really know about it unless you really know about it. So it's not like people sort of fall into it. Um, so generally, if you're a mature age student and you're coming to do it, you know why you're coming to do it. So just tell us. Tell us why you really want to do it. Thank you so it. much, Judith. That is the last slide. I just want to, we have a question on what sort of jobs do industrial designers get to do once they graduate or even throughout their program? Right. Okay. So uh, again, traditionally, you would have been, say, sitting in a product design consultancy um, and so designing products. Um, and that would be anything from white goods to lighting to furniture, consumer electronics, that sort of stuff. Traditionally, it would have been transportation. Now we call it mobility. So that can be like bikes or wheelchairs as opposed to cars. Um, these days, the field's really expanding. So as I said, service design, we're having people go into sustainability. We're having people go into all sorts of different areas of uh, research. Um, so we have a lot of students go into what we call the designer maker area where you go out and you work for generally in Australia to be somebody that's like a furniture lighting type company. Um, and you go out and initially those sort of students might start kind of in the area where they're helping put the work together, but then eventually they'll build up to be sort of a senior designer. Um, so again, it's everything from your, your sort of your making, your product design. And these days, uh, with uh, the advancements of digital technology, there's this idea that we've dematerialised and we haven't dematerialised. We're surrounded by more stuff than ever. But you might be in a multidisciplinary uh, consultancy where they'll have a service design team, um, they'll have a coding team, and you as the industrial designer might be the only person there that knows how to make anything. Um, and you might be able, you might be the one that actually has to develop the product that encapsulates the product or the service um, that's going in it. Um, and you might have to do the electronic prototyping or organise for that to be done. And that's where that sort of, where we're going into there. I think um, some of the other uh, presenters talked about it before. We're going into these diverse multidisciplinary teams. You might be sitting there from somebody who's gone through animation or games design as well, um, or service design uh, in the comms, de comms degree. Thank you so much, Judith. That's all we have time for, but there is a ton of questions coming through yeah. via the chat. So Judith will be online to answer some of those via text. So um, Judith would absolutely stick around. Thanks, and just everybody. No worries. Thank you so much. And just also, if you're wanting to hear more about industrial design um, via the RMIT Open Day platform, we currently have Associate Dean of Industrial Design, Ian Dever who's presenting um, as part of a panel on career paths that make a, so, a difference through social and environmental change. So um, if you're interested in industrial design and you want to go ask more questions and hear about more um, breadth as part of that program, that's another session that's on um, running concurrently at the moment as well. Um, but I just want to... Um, Apologies, we have run a little bit over time, uh, but we last but not least as part of our presenters is David Cutter from um, the communication design area who will walk us through the selection task as part of that program. So over to you, David. Thank you so much for waiting. Thank you. Okay, team. Um, now I've got to see how the split screen is working against me as well. Um, so what I'll be work, walking through Fairly briefly, I'd say, is the focus on the selection tasks for the Bachelor of Design Communication Design. And let's walk through that. So, Tim, if you could take me to the next slide. Thank you. And I see that that is already cropped off as well. So I just need to obviously walk through the basics with the tertiary study um, status question. There are basic prerequisites that we can see. Um, it's fairly self-evident in terms of what you've got there. So I'll just take us, if we could, Tim, to the next slide. I'll make sure that um, we can paste this well, but that everybody who's in on the session can read as well as possible. I can't see that that slide's actually uh, provided all of its content. Um, could that be 
may be refreshed. It's um odd to the to the audience. It is quite um it's it's the normal size. It might just be on your screen, David. My screen has had most of that actually butchered, so I can't actually read it. Um, so am I looking at the application requirements? Uh, selection task requirements. Yeah, one, two, three, four. Yes, that's the slide. Okay, then let's start with number one. So the application requirements that do include the tertiary study status question. I hope I'm that on that page because I'm not seeing that drawn. Properly. Correct. Um, the actual, have you successfully completed at least one year? Look, the overview of this, as you can read, it's basically to identify whether there's any potential for advanced standing of basically uh, credit that can be applied. Now, anybody who's coming from year 12 from VCE, that's not relevant to, but anybody who's applying to the program that naturally has uh, tertiary studies, this is where there may be an opportunity to pick up some credit points and that could uh, mean a reduced study load of a first year or, or first year commencement of the program and potentially even to uh, second year commencement into the program based on RPL, which is recognition, prior learning and credits. But let's go past that. If we could change the slide and move forward, because basically that's what I've just covered. We've moved forward, yep. Um, so if we could move forward again by one slide, thank you. All right, so I believe what we're looking at now is the responses to the design statement one and statement two. Um, I wish I could see that that slide has everything that I'm looking at, but can I just confirm that I'm looking at design statement one Correct. and design statement two? Yes. Thank you. All right, interesting that com design gets sliced. So with the first one, design statement one, describe how your interests and experience will contribute to the RMIT communication design community. Interests and experience can include any employment, voluntary work, et cetera. Um, I will say on this point, I know that all of the presenters have had very similar scenarios in some respects of the fact that we're looking from all applicants about information about yourselves as an applicant um, part of it is naturally to provide an insight about you for us to see how suitable as a candidate you can be for the program. And the fact that your interest and experience uh, would actually walk into the scenario of blending with everybody else. And like all, all the other programs, we do really seek a diverse uh, cohort of students. And we're very interested to see literally what you can bring into the table it would be about conversations, it would be about projects, it would be about the interweaving of discussions of all of what would be part of a full um, journey experience for all of you as a natural part of it. And so that's a really important part. So the interest that we have is the insights. It's important that you read these questions well. I will say for those who are interested in applying for any of these programs, whether it is Design or the others, it's most important you guys make sure that you're providing us with a thoughtful and appropriate response and answer to the questions and don't misread it. Misreading questions and not providing enough information or providing wrong, wrong information is the perfect way for you to miss out on an offer. I will say that across the board. It's most important that across the board you work that. Now in com design and communication design, the first word's got to come up. And if you can't communicate correctly, if you can't actually respond to questions correctly, it immediately establishes a reality check that we say, okay, if this person as an applicant can't satisfy the basics, they're not really very much a candidate next to the next person who can. So we need to make sure that we're looking at that, but connectivity towards the program's culture is an important part of, for all of us. The actual program prides itself on its studio base that a lot of these programs do, and that establishes a strong sense of strong sense of community and connection. And so all of that, your previous experience is an important part of it. The design statement too, which is about describing an aspect of your local or broader community where design could have a positive impact and how you think this could be achieved. Now, this one's an important one too, because this is where we're asking you to be more outwardly looking and be very much community and more world aware about where design and design language and communication through design is making impacts, has made impacts and can make impacts. So like other programs, uh, the program RMIT for communication design, it's not focusing on design exclusively. This undergraduate program is much more broad thinking and, 
and diverse. And it's about how thinking related to communication design and broadly, whether it's UI, UX, and it does include considerations like other programs of service design, how these intertwine and how the broader community does benefit from initiatives and literally design and creative thinking. And that's really part of it. So the second design statement really does put a focus on your awareness of literally how creative thinking can provide an impact, not what's currently there. It's about how you're showing your initiative of where you can see it can contribute. If we can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so let's talk about the actual um, projects in terms of the up to four images in total. Um, do know that naturally what we're asking for you to do, as you would probably expect, is to provide technically a mini folio, but you've got a real restriction on this. And we're looking for fundamentally the equivalence of PDFs. Okay, so in that respect, what we need here from all of you naturally is what you'd expect is a bit of an insight in terms of your creativity. But please know that this is not a technical oriented graphic design program where the merits of your uh, crafting skills are highest in terms of priority. From our point of view, what we want to see from you is like other programs have said, what you're passionate about, what you're really strong about, and what will reflect that best. You will naturally, like other programs have said, you'll get advice from other people, from parents, from family members, teachers, from um, secondary school, et cetera. And I'd say it's all very nice for them to say that, but what's most important is for you to put your best foot forward and show what is truly your passion and what's strong about you Again, I know it's good to take advice from others, but do know that it's a highly competitive program. To probably answer a question that would come up in terms of um, how many people do get offers to literally enter the undergraduate program for communication design. Well, the combination of both local students and international students, we're looking around about an entry cohort of 250. Now that sounds like a lot, but I'd say, that's highly competitive and that's across both the combination of local and international. So back to the point about you putting your best foot forward and showing the work that really shows your, your strengths and insights into you. This is so you get a chance of being literally a candidate for an offer. If you just provide pres pres um, prescript prescriptive uh, presentations of content, I'd say you've got less chance of getting an offer. And certainly if you combine that with not really answering those first two selection questions well, I'd say you've got no chance of being a candidate for an offer. So do know that what we ask all of you to be doing is being thoughtful in what you write, what you say to represent yourself, and how you partner that with the four images and really up to four images. And you only have the opportunity to really support talking about providing insights into one of those projects. And so do know that what you write here is really quite crucial. Now, I will say that, of course, that some would take the initiative of putting links rather than PDFs. And I'd say, like others, be cautious about links. They're not 100% reliable. We have had problems and we constantly do. They are not always doing the right thing by yourselves and by us. And we ask you to once again, follow the requirements outlined in the selection application itself and ensure that what you do upload, like others have said, does guarantee good performance, that these files will open, that they have the integrity that will very much present what you intended, and that it literally is a quality uh, file that will not pixelize, pixelize, because that once again reflects on really the nature of who you are and the type of candidate you are. Please make sure you're on top of that, okay? But what's written on screen, I'm sure, provides the outline of the basics. I'm not sure if there's another um, slide to follow this, but if we can go there to confirm, then yes, we do. Um, really what I've probably outlined under, underlines the basics. What I've said underlines the basics of what you can see here. What you do expect is this program has a strong focus on the visual, but this program actually does have a strong focus on creative and um, 
broad thinking that will intertwine you in the long term, really working across more of a multi-discipline scenario than more exclusively in what was traditionally a design or marketing agency where there's just focused on pure design projects. It's actually much more broad and diverse than that. Your ability to articulate and to explain and express your thinking, as well as to very much um, represent the potential in your thinking, your creative thinking, is really going to be the step of getting an offer. So please note this, this is not a standard graphic design program. This is something more outward. It is creative focus. It is driven by the ideas and the intention and the articulation of the individual. So having said that, I'm sure what on screen is doing is just underlining that. I'm not sure if that's the last slide, if we can go to the next one, if there is one. Once again, I'm. it's not great. So I did just, that's, I think, got through that's that. That's the last it's, one there. It's, um, it, thanks for listening question. So um, you've reached the end of the slides. That's all good. Um, David, there are quite a few questions coming through, if that's okay. So, and the first is, would the course uh, with the communication design course be relevant if you're interested in working in a design agency or what other relevant um, career outcomes for this particular program? Uh, this is an interesting one because the world's shifting. Uh, when I say that is in the likes of design studios, design agencies, advertising agencies, marketing studios, blended um, practices, um, uh, to a point uh, devolving uh, to having more fluid project teams. What we're seeing across communication design across the world is there is a shift from employment within the set business to more of the mobile freelance model of teams being built to suit projects. But that doesn't mean that individuals don't get ongoing contracts work project to project within businesses and they set up partnerships do the same. It's quite a diverse field where historically it would have been literally getting employment in a design studio or a design agency and the like, but now that that's shifted, what we've seen naturally what COVID's done for the last 18 months has challenged the full structure worldwide and the employment base has shifted, um, but it doesn't mean that the work has diminished. So it's still a broad base. It is quite a fluid domain. But really, any individual who's really interested in walking to this domain needs to be somebody who's prepared to be adaptable and flexible and certainly mobile. And as a student, all of you guys naturally would be have seen information about the animation and other programs in terms of possibly being hands on. A lot of what this program does do is it focuses on, yes, software or working through the computer and laptop. Um, platforms, and that's exactly a rep replication or a reflection of how industries operate. Of course, there's still artworks depend depending on imagery that is still done by hand, but mostly it is transferred into the um, hardware and software platforms and beyond. So there's a quite a flexible landscape here. Well, and one more last question: Should the four images be developmental or refined concepts? Perfect. Look, what's ideal is once again, we want the insight into the potential of creative thinking. For you to refine it and show refined work is not as important as for you to show the thinking behind your intention. And so really uh, more progress oriented work rather than refined final work is much more of an insight there. And what you can provide in terms of explanation of what you intended, what you were exploring and the direction you were taking is much more important. As I said, this program being an HE, not a VE, it's not focused on the technical, it's more focused on the expansive creative in terms of creative thinking than, than for your, for your um, selection task choice of imagery and works, we'd recommend don't expect that we want to have high finish outcomes presented. It doesn't necessarily mean that you'll step in front of somebody else for an offer. Not the case. Wonderful. Thank you so much, David. And thank you so much to all our panellists and to um, everyone who's joined us this evening. I acknowledge we're a couple of minutes over, um, but thank you so much for your time. Today has been a fantastic session. Um, and a great opportunity to hear about each of the selection tasks throughout design. Um, like I mentioned at the start of the session, 
um, there will this video will be recorded. So I know you, there will be quite a few students at home frantically taking notes. Um, don't stress, you can go back and rewatch it via the Open Day platform. Um, but if I can get Tim to just put on the last slide, um, as I mentioned at the start of the session, there is open day this coming um, Sunday, the 29th of August, and there are two sessions as part of the open day experience for the School of Design. The first is at 11 a.m. Um, on communication and industrial design, and so this covers the actual program material um, and what's included as part of the programs, and you'll have the opportunity to hear from lecturers um, as part of those two programs. Um, and then digital design at 1 p.m. covers digital media animation um, and game design as well. So um, absolutely recommend going along to those sessions as well if you're interested in those programs um, because you'll hear more about what's on offer. But for tonight, that is the end of the session. Thank you so much to all our presenters again. Um, and I'm sure um, we will hear from you all um, in the near future um, as you look to submit your selection task. One more um, just note as well. Um, if you do have any questions, the best team to get in touch with um, about the selection task is the design team. So that is design at rmit.edu.au. Thank you so much and, and have a great evening.